How's everyone doing this morning? Excellent. You doing okay this morning? Yeah. Excited to be continuing our slow walk through the book of Galatians, where last week we looked at verse 10 of chapter 1. The Apostle Paul says there that if he was to be a pleaser of people, if he was to live for people, that he would not be a servant of Christ. And so he said last week that as disciples of the Lord Jesus, we want to live in a way not where people are big and God is small, but where God is big and people are small. But how do we know? We know because when people are big, we tend to hide. We know because when people are big, we tend to compromise. And we know because when people are big, we tend to live out of comparison, but instead we want to live in what the Bible calls the fear of the Lord, and we do that because God is a righteous judge. And we fear and honor God as our heavenly Father, that though He was strong and mighty and such that even by the will and strength of His power, He upholds all of creation, including the awesome power of the Son. This heavenly Father knows, loves, and cares for you every hair on your head numbered. And so we live in a way where God is big and where people are small. And today as we continue to look in the book of Galatians in verses 11 and 12, Paul is going to tell us how it is that he came to saving faith, how it is that he came to believe in the person that he now calls Messiah and who he now calls Lord. And this is chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. I know we were just standing, but if you don't, uh, everyone willing to stand once again? We've got to rethink all this up and down. It's good. This is Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Where the Apostle Paul, I can turn there too on my screen. The Apostle Paul says this, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather... I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated and let's pray together. Even Heavenly Father, we pray, Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be present with us as we spend time in your word. We pray that you would uh, confront us, comfort us, change us, because we are un- unable to do these things on our own. But with you, All things are possible, and apart from you, we can do no good thing. May we be the one who builds our house upon the rock of Christ so that when the storm comes, we will not be blown away. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we want to talk about, dialogue together, about how Paul describes how he comes to know the Lord Jesus. He, he says in the beginning, uh, in verse 11, that the gospel that he now believes, the gospel that has now transformed him, was not of human origin, and he's also clear that it was not taught him from human origin, but he says that he received it, and he received it, as he says, by revelation. And that revelation is from Jesus Christ himself. And what we want to do today is to explore what does Paul mean when he says, I received it by revelation. And part of what we will be suggesting this morning is that the greatest need of our world today, if perhaps the greatest need, is for revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean And to understand what Paul means to say, I received it by revelation, we need need to dig a bit deeper into this word and to look in Scripture to see how this word is used to understand what is the world's greatest need. How did Paul come about receiving this gospel? Now, the word that is used there that's translated into English as word revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis. That's its noun form. Now, it's verbal form, apocalypto. Now, if I say the word apocalypsis, what, is that, what word does that sound like? Apocalypse. Yes, the word apocalypse. And that's actually where the word apocalypse or apocalyptic and things like that, that's where the word in English comes from, is the Greek word apocalypsis. Now, when I say the word apocalypse, what image comes into your mind? What does this word apocalypse mean? 
Now, I'm, I'm going to guess, even as you're thinking about it, I'm going to show a, an image, and I'm going to guess it's something like this. And this is an accurate rendering of how the word apocalypse is defined in English. If you look into Webster's Dictionary of the word apocalypse, there are two definitions. The one is a description of the end of the world, particularly in the book of Revelation in the Bible. That's that. Now, it's also defined another way as um, an apocalyptic and a catastrophic event of awesome destructive power. You might think of an apocalyptic earthquake or something like that. So, in a way, uh, we might conceive of the fires in Colorado as being apocalyptic, depending on how you understand that. Even the the city where my wife and I were married is currently evacuated because of fires in Colorado. So we might have been praying about that. But this is how that word is used in English. It means the end of the world or some kind of a catastrophic destructive event. Now, it's just interesting to note that in Greek, as that word was used in the first century, that is not even a possibility of definition. In other words, it isn't like, well, in Greek, that's one of the definitions, but there are others. It's not even one of them. That's interesting. So when the word apocalypsis is used in Greek, it doesn't mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean an an awesome catastrophic event, which is then, again, interesting to think the book of Revelation. We're not going there today, but hmm, I wonder. What does the word apocalypsis mean? In Greek, it means to disclose something. It means to reveal something something. It means to manifest something, something that was previously hidden but now has been made known, is what apocalypsis. As an example, a modern-day example, in the play but was then made into a movie, The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz is about a character from Kansas named Dorothy who finds herself in Oz and her and her friends are traveling along the yellow brick road to arrive at the Emerald City to meet with the Wizard of Oz. And when they finally arrive at the Emerald City, they encounter this uh, terrifying figure of the wizard. And all uh, Dorothy and her friends are struck with fear as they see the wizard until Dorothy's dog Toto goes over to the side and begins to pull back a curtain. Do you remember this scene? And all of a sudden, the terrifying wizard, it ends up that it's just an old man behind a curtain operating instruments off to the side. But when Toto pulls back the curtain, that is an apocalypse. That is a revealing. That is a manifesting. This is something that was previously hidden but has been pulled back in order to make known the reality of what was always there. And what Paul the apostle says is that I received... By a revealing, I received by a manifestation something that was hidden but then was made known to me, a revelation or unveiling of Jesus Christ. And again, the greatest need of our world today is an unveiling, a revealing, a making known of Jesus Christ. What we need today in our world today is Jesus. It's that old Sunday school answer, every answer has the answer Jesus. Well, what's our greatest need today? Jesus. Jesus is the greatest need today. And what we're going to talk about this morning is what does it mean for Jesus to make himself known? Because Paul says, I didn't receive this from man. I received it because of an apocalypse. I received it because of an unveiling of Jesus. How does Jesus make himself known? How does God make himself known? What happens when God makes himself known to us as human creatures? And then what does God need to do to bring salvation to you and me? What does he need to do? So the first thing we want to say as we explore this concept of an apocalypse, an unveiling, uh, a manifestation, is that God is always unveiling himself. God is always making himself known. God desires to be known. God desires for people to know him. And one of the ways that we see where God is in an ongoing way manifesting who he is is through creation itself. It's not necessarily the only way, but it's a way that the Bible describes how God reveals himself. All the way back in the Old Testament, Psalm 19, we read this, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they what? Reveal knowledge. 
They are disclosing. God is a spirit. So you can't like look here and here's there, here's there, there's God. God discloses himself, makes himself known through the creation. It's revealing him. Later on in the New Testament, and I would put money that, not that I would ever gamble, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but, but I would, I can't say wager, I would imagine that the Apostle Paul has Psalm 19 on his brain when in Romans 1 he says this, that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. How? By what has been made. That the heavens declare the earth, the creation is declaring God, his invisible qualities and his eternal nature and divine power. Now, just a few verses earlier, the Apostle Paul goes on to say that nature and creation are not only or simply displaying, um, and God is not simply making clear to people that way his nature, but it says in verse 18 that God is also revealing something else, his wrath. His wrath. And here's this word again, revealed. So this is right. The wrath of God is being apocalypsed from heaven. It's being revealed. It's being, being manifest against all the godlessness of wickedness of people. Why? Because God has made it plain to them. God has made it plain to them. God is revealing himself. He desires to be known. And one of the ways we see that is in creation, which is interesting. I don't know if you've ever felt this way. I have felt this way at times, and maybe someone can relate to this. When you feel distant from God or you feel like you want to reconnect spiritually with God, what's something that you can do? What, you know, of course, read and pray in Scripture and all of that, of course. One thing that you can do is take a walk in nature. Have you ever taken a walk in the beauty of God's creation and felt a connection with Him? Does anyone, can anyone give testimony to that? And here we are in the beautiful Michigan. We got all of God's creativity for, on display for us in the colors of the leaves. And there is something about that. Now, we don't want to make nature into some kind of a deity itself. That's where you get to mother nature and, you know, nature becomes a god. We're not talking about that. We're saying that God reveals himself there. So don't be surprised when we go into nature, we spend time there, that we feel a connection with God because God's revealing himself there. But as God reveals himself, apocalypses himself, and desires to be known, there is a problem. There is a problem. What is that problem? You and me are the problem. Specifically, specifically this, that as Paul says, that the problem is, is that people suppress that truth by their wickedness. Yes, God is revealing himself. He's making known his wrath, his qualities, his divine nature, his reality, his existence, but people suppress that truth by their wickedness. He goes on to see that people know God. Everyone knows him, but they don't glorify him. They don't give thanks to him, and their thinking becomes futile, and their hearts are darkened, as it says in, this, in the Psalms. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So although they know it, they refuse to acknowledge it. And not only that, but they are blinded by the evil one. The evil one, who's the God of this age, blinds them so they cannot see. So their wickedness suppresses the knowledge of God. They know Him. They don't glorify Him. They become darkened. Their thinking is futile. And there are powers at work to keep them in bondage so that they're blind and they can't see. Now, what does this mean? Something of what this means and what this Scripture passages would suggest is that deep down at the root of the matter, there, as far as the existence of God is concerned, there is no such thing as an honest atheist. No such thing. Because what the Scripture is saying is that deep down in the core of their soul, now they may suppress it, but they know there is a God. They know it. They don't want to admit it, and they only might think about it in the early morning hours when they can't sleep. And they know not only is there a God, but they know that that God will hold them accountable there is going to be a judgment where they will have to give an accounting of their life. They all know it. They don't want to talk about it, and it probably only comes up in times in the deep, dark hours of the night. But God says he's made it plain to them. But as God is revealing himself, humanity 
in their wickedness and bondage is saying no. God is saying, yes, know me. I'm revealing myself. I want you to know me. Mankind is saying, no, I don't want to know you. I don't want to know you. Psalm 10 says that in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All of his thoughts are there is no God. And I wonder why does it say all of his thoughts are there is no God? That's an interesting way to put it, all of his thoughts. Have you ever had something that you know is true but you just don't want to believe that it's true? You keep saying to yourself over and over again, it's not the case, it's not the case, it's not the case. It's not, just to convince yourself of something that you know is true. And I wonder how much that that's what the psalmist is saying. All of his thoughts are there is no God, there is no God, there is no God, because he knows that there is a God. But as God is revealing himself, mankind says no. So if God is going to break through our wickedness, break through the bondage that we find ourselves in, God has to do more. God has to intervene and reveal an apocalypse himself in a greater measure. And how does he do that? Through Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the apocalypse of God. Jesus reveals God. Think about it, when, when, when uh, Jesus, it says in uh, Hebrews 1 verse 3 that Jesus is the exact representation of the being of God. He reveals who God is. When, when, uh, when they come to him and Jesus show us the Father, what does Jesus say? Hold on, here's a picture, right? No, he says, no, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Jesus is an apocalypse. It doesn't mean that Jesus is the end of the world or a catastrophic event. Jesus is the manifestation of God himself. And Jesus says this, you cannot get to God. You cannot get to God except through me. Except through me. I am the apocalypse of God. I am the revelation of God. And I am the means and the way to God. And unless Jesus breaks into your life, unless Jesus breaks into the life of this world, there is no hope. Jesus is the only hope. And the only hope of this world is that Jesus apocalypses himself to the world so that he can break through all the wickedness of mankind and he can break through the bondage. Jesus says you cannot break into the strong man's house until what? Until you bind the strong man. And that is only going to be through the power of Jesus. And Jesus in, in uh, Matthew's gospel says that there is only one who knows the Father. Who's the only one who knows the Father? The Son. And who's the only one who knows the Son? The Father. And he says that no one knows the Father except the Father, Father, the Son. And those, he says, whom the Son chooses to apocalypse him. Jesus must reveal. That's what Paul says, that this was apocalypsed to me. It was revealed to me. Think about the, uh, the Damascus Road, Acts chapter 9. Paul is heading to Damascus. Is, when Paul is headed to Damascus, is he looking for Jesus? No. What is, Jesus, what is Paul doing on his way to Damascus? Persecute Christians. He was darkened in his thinking. He was futile in his mind, right? And it isn't until God apocalypses himself, reveals himself to Paul on the way to Damascus as a shining bright light throws him to the ground, and then you hear this voice saying, Paul or Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? And he, and he says, well, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus. Until that happens, until God reveals himself, and he doesn't have to knock us off our horse with a blinding light, but he reveals himself to us, then we are doomed without hope. Jesus comes to his disciples, and he asks them a very famous question. He says, who do people say that I am? Now, who speaks up to respond? Peter speaks up, and he says, a proclamation of the good news. The good news is the good news of Jesus, and the good news of Jesus is that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises of God, the fulfillment of all the promises to Israel, and he's Lord of the world. And that's what, exactly what Peter says. He says, look, you are the Messiah, you are the fulfillment of the promises to Israel, and you're the son of the living God. You're the king who's promised in Psalm 2, who God said, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and I will make you Lord of the world. And here's what Peter says, you're that guy. Now, how does Jesus respond to Peter? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood, he says, have not apocalypsed this to you. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. 
my Father in heaven has. Salvation is of the Lord, Psalm 3, verse 6. Salvation belongs to God. He saves you. He breaks through. He reveals and apocalypses himself to you in a saving way. And he does that through the means of the gospel. Romans 1 says the gospel is the power of God to those who believe. He says, I'm not ashamed because it's the power of the gospel to bring salvation. And look what it says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is apocalypsed. Same word. So the revelation, the revelation of the righteousness of God, which is in the gospel, and the gospel itself is the power of God to salvation, which we just said is the power to reveal Jesus in a saving way. Because apart from the apocalypse of God, apart from the revealing and manifestation of Jesus, the Bible says that you and I are dead, dead, dead. We are unable to respond. Why? Because of what Paul says in Romans 1. We suppress the truth in wickedness. We're in bondage. We're blind. Tell a blind person, describe for me this mountain scene. Can they do it? It's, well, the answer is no, right? Okay. It's the same thing with the gospel and believing. If you take a dead person who can't see and you say, believe the gospel, I'm dead, I'm blind, I can't. It is only if Jesus reaches into your life by the Holy Spirit, being sent by the Father to reveal him. He takes your dead heart, he takes it out, puts in a living, beating spiritual heart, he brings you into relationship with him, and then you come willing to have faith. And that's what exactly what Ephesians says. Ephesians chapter 2 says, but God, and if it isn't for this, but God, we're doomed. We're doomed. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, even when we were blind, even when we were suppressing the truth, even when we are living in rebellion, even when we cannot see, it says that he made us alive together with Christ. This is not your doing, he says that none may boast. It is a gift of God. And the amazing thing is that you and I have the opportunity to participate in that. Isn't that amazing? We can participate in this work of God to bring dead things to life. How do we do that? What is the power of God in the salvation? The gospel. And you and I have an invitation to participate in the gospel. How do we do that? through proclam- I say proclamation and proclaiming at the same time. Through proclamation, we proclaim the gospel. What's the greatest need of our world today? Proclaimers of the gospel so they can know Jesus. Proclaimers of the gospel. That's what people need today. We look around our world and everything seems all crazy and nuts and whatever. I agree with you. What's the greatest need? Jesus. The gospel is what everybody needs. Everybody can have a lot of opinions on a lot of other things, but the greatest root need is the gospel. It's the gospel. And lastly, as we come to a close, I want to suggest that as Jesus apocalypses himself to you, reveals himself to you, and if you are in Christ, he has done that. He has done that. Praise be to God. That apocalypse is also an invitation. It's also an invitation It's interesting that in the passage where Jesus says, no one knows the Son except the Father, no one knows the Father except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him, the very next verse says that, Father, this is good and right in your sight. You have hidden these things from the wise and learned, but that you have apocalypse. You have revealed these things to little children. This was good and pleasing in your sight. This is according to your perfect will. The very next verse after that. So Jesus talks about apocalypsing himself Choosing to do that to little children means we have to come to them humble. The very next verse in that context is this. Can you guess what it is? The very next verse in this context. Come to me. That's the very next verse within this context. I'm revealing myself to you. I do that through my choice. I reveal and I do that to children. I I hide it over here, but I reveal it over here. This is my choice. It's good and perfect in your sight. Come to me. Come to me. What's going on here? As Jesus reveals himself to us, 
He does that because he wants to be in relationship with you. He loves you. You're his child. He reveals himself to you to make you alive that you might be adopted into his family. And as he reveals himself to you, that is an invitation for you to reveal yourself to him. Uh, Come to me all who are weary and burdened. This is an illustration and we'll close. Uh, I, uh, this week was playing, um, there's a game called Guess Who. Um, I play this with Thomas, our four-year-old. And what you do is you have all these doors that are open that have all these different uh, pictures of a face and then you have to guess who the other person is by saying, do you have a mustache? And if he says yes, then you get rid of all the other ones that don't. Or do you have brown hair and yes? And then you eventually guess what the other person is. That's how you, it's called Guess Who. And it's, Thomas likes to play it, but Thomas, like all of us, don't like, doesn't like to lose. And so the, the closer you guess to who he actually is, his response is, don't ask me that. <laughs> so if, if he is characterized as a mustache, there's only three characters that have mustaches. You say, Thomas, do you have a mustache? He says, don't ask me that. <laughs> what do you mean, don't ask me? Don't ask me that. Ask me if I have white hair. <laughs> Why, do you have white hair? No. You know, so that's how Thomas plays the game. Because it's not like that. So as soon as he says, don't ask me that, you know that that's actually what the case is. That's what he really is. But I wonder how often our relationship with Jesus is like that. Jesus desires to know you. Jesus has completely revealed himself to you. Even as Jesus reveals his character by saying, I am humble and lowly, that's, that's a further apocalypse. It's a further revealing of God's nature. So as Jesus reveals himself, he says, come to me. Reveal yourself back. Reveal yourself back. And what is often the case is when God gets closest to who we really are, we have a tendency to back off. Don't ask me that. Don't ask me that. I don't want to give that thing to you. Ask me if I'm this. Don't ask me that. And what Jesus is saying, because the things that we say, don't ask me that, are typically the things that cause us anxiety, the things that worry us, the things that cause us shame, the things that cause us regret. Those are the things we say, don't ask me that. Ask me about this. And Jesus says, you know those other things that you said don't ask me about? Bring those to me. Bring those to me. I've apocalypsed myself completely to you. Now reveal yourself to me. Because when you do that, I'll give you rest because what God wants to do is to reveal himself within those things. The pain that you feel, those things that you say, look, I don't wanna bring those to God. God says, bring those to me because I wanna reveal myself within that. If you have a difficult relationship, I don't wanna bring that to God, I don't wanna do it. Bring it to him, he wants to reveal himself within it. So even as we close this morning, I'd love for all of us to be able to bring something to God this morning. For us to apocalypse ourselves to God. And to say, Lord, there's something on my heart, there's something on my mind, there's something on my soul that I'm bringing this morning. It's weary to me. It's burdening to me. It's one of those things, God, where I'd almost be tempted to say, don't ask me about that. Let's, let's make this moment right now a time where we can bring that to him so that he can reveal apocalypse himself in the midst of that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the greatest need that we have for everyone in Christ. You've given us the greatest gift, the gift of yourself, the greatest gift of the revealing of yourself, that you've broken through our wickedness, forgiven us our sin, that you've broken through our bondage to evil, that you've bound the strong man, and that you have revealed to us your righteousness in the gospel and the light of the glory of Christ. And Lord, you desire to make yourself known to us. And Lord, in response, we want to make ourselves known to you. And Lord, I pray right now in the quietness of our heart, if there's something where we're saying, don't ask me that, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would bring to mind right now that thing that's burdening us, that's weighing us down in the quietness of our heart. What is that thing? Reveal it now, we pray.
Lord, we declare that you are Lord and Savior, that you're bigger than that thing. We also declare that you want to make yourself known within that. And Lord, we, in our souls right now, we bring it to you. Even in our mind, we want to visualize, actually, maybe even like picking that thing up in our mind and laying it at the cross. We do that right now. We thank you, Jesus, that you are gentle and lowly, that your burden is light. And we pray, God, that we would be reminded anew and afresh this morning the greatest need of our world is Jesus, is you. And Lord, we pray that we would be on mission to participate in the proclamation of the gospel in word and deed because it is the power of God unto salvation because within it the righteousness of God is revealed. And we pray that we would live in a way where we are continually in an ongoing way revealing ourselves to you, opening up the deepest, darkest parts of ourselves that we come to you weary and burdened and that you would give us rest this day, tomorrow, and forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.